So welcome to the January, I guess it's the January Contributors Hangout, but we moved it by a week. Uh, so I'm Bhaskar. Uh, uh, I manage GWT at Google. Just quickly around the room and we can... I'm John. Uh, I work on the GWT compiler. Brian Sosinski. I work on dev mode and super dev mode. I'm Roberto Dublinerman, and I work on the compiler as well. Uh, my name's Gyukchu, and I work on the libraries. Okay. And on the... VC. Pardon? I'm Matthew uh, Dempsey. Oh. No, go ahead. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I'm Matthew yeah. Dempsey. Yeah. I work on kind of GWT health and code refactoring and general trying to keep GWT working inside Google. I'm Colin Allworth. I work at Centra on uh, GXT. I'm Jean Adamé. I'm working on integrating uh, Google Cruiser style sheet with uh, with Grids. Yeah, and a few others. Uh, just say hi, guys. Mm -hmm. I cannot hear you. I'm uh, Tony Stewart. I work for Centra. I've been using uh, Grids since 2007. I uh, used to work for IBM, spent most of my career. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm James Nelson. I work at Appian. I'm working on the um, source map debugger plugin for Eclipse and a couple other little side projects. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Carlos. I'm a front end engineer. I work uh, along with uh, James at Appian and looking forward to see how can we contribute. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, let's get started. I think maybe we should just go around quickly and see where status is on various things we're working on, and then we can discuss other patches. We, I think, have a hard break at 11.30, so, yep. OK. John, you want to start with the modular compilation stuff? Yeah, start? so uh, I'm still working on uh, modular compilation. We're getting uh, significantly close now. We've got 15, 1,700 lines uh, remaining in the prototype that are not reviewed, tested, and committed. So we're getting pretty close. Um, uh, there's a, a significant chunk of what's remaining that is uh, casting implementation needs to be tweaked to be able to be uh, global or local, depending on how much knowledge you have. Um, and so I'm working a little bit on that, but mostly around the edges of that right now. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to go next because you're well, and, uh, Yeah, so I'm working on the refactoring in the compiler to, to get the cast map implementations to work uh, for, for both optimized and separate compilation. Um, and yeah, I'm doing these refactorings to be able to integrate the prototype and still preserve this, the optimized code, the same, the same <coughs> amount of optimization that we have now. OK. okay. Um, I guess I'll say it's like after getting the last Firefox release done, I'm going back on various improvements to make super dev mode better. Um, right now, it's like working on like essentially compiler side changes. So there's a change that will land pretty soon so that um, it's essentially doing null null pointer checks for this. So what, what will happen is sometimes we will convert instance methods to static methods, but we won't check that this is not null. So, so that's kind of confusing for people coming from Java because you expect that you get a null pointer exception. So I'm, I'm putting in a type error and then basically moving on from that to other Compile, compiler side cleanups to um, make it work more like Java. So, okay. Yeah. Any yeah, go next? Yeah, I I'm working on various cleanup. <coughs> sorry, various cleanup tasks right now, and uh, one of the things that's uh, going on uh, slowly is the exception. Uh, replacement with uh, making all the exceptions with JavaScript exceptions so that we can uh, make uh, conversion between two easier. That's one thing going on. On the other side, uh, in the last days I have been looking into the uh, uh, implicit bindings in Google Gene so that we can uh, create automatically create some bindings like the UI binder related bindings without you needing to extend the UI binder itself. So uh, I'm working on an extension on Google Gen so that we can do it automatically. So that's another thing. And after those, I think I'm going to start looking into the elemental stuff for uh, 
for making it uh, work with JS interface. So. Is um is Ray working on the JS interface stuff right now? Uh, I haven't been hearing about him. So uh, uh, yeah, so let me. Uh, JS Ray, from him, yeah, so. Ray isn't here, but uh, I know that he's uh, <coughs> to get the JS interface completely implemented. I I don't know where he's at, but it's his goal is. Yeah. I think he's kind of focused on that. Uh, um, so we should. Yeah, he might be trying some stuff internally to see some problems. Uh, he didn't update the, the page yet, mm -hmm. but I, I can imagine he's trying uh, some stuff. So. <coughs> OK. Uh, so anything from there, you guys? Uh, Matthew, you want to <coughs> uh, talk about the stuff you're working on? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, I've been working on trying to document how a lot of the build system and well I mean I guess I just finished up the GWT 2.6 release and now I've been working on documenting the uh, build infrastructure. Yeah, actually, I think, yeah that, that was actually a great accomplishment. I think it's, it, it was quite a bit of time from RC to the final, but I think we ended up with a with a pretty good uh, pretty good release. Thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah. And no problem. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so yeah so now I'm just documenting stuff. So. Okay. Uh, at one point, we should discuss when to do the the maintenance list for two point six. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think there's a couple of people uh, who are missing. Uh, <coughs> uh, Ray is uh, Ray is busy with something, but um, but he's he's working on the JS interface we talked about. Uh, Daniel is looking at permutations and uh, trying to make some headway there. Uh, uh, I don't know the exact status on that. At some point, he's going to probably write something up on that. Um, OK, so you guys, you want to talk about the stuff you guys are working on? Uh, maybe Julian or James or any one of you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I will start. Uh, <clears throat> So I implemented the, the conditional CSS on uh, GSS resource. So maybe I would just share my screen to, to show you how it's work quickly. Uh, sure. Let me do that. So OK, do, do you see my screen? In, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is how I implemented the, the conditional uh, CSS um, in GSS resource. So I just create a, a, a is function here, and so we have an elegant way to specify. Okay, uh, if uh, look, maybe the is function can take two parameter or one parameter. If the is function take two parameter, the first parameter is the name of the permutation we want to test on. And the second parameter is the value of the permutation. And if you specify only one parameter, we suppose that you want to test on the user agent. So we can do you know, uh, um, do something like if uh, is I eight or I nine and it's not local English, okay, you apply this style. Else if is Safari, you apply this style. Else else you apply this style. So. Uh, if we compare with uh, with uh, the equivalent in CSS resource, uh, I think it's a little bit more elegant to use a function that's only uh, uh, that using w the, the the old way to do that with the, the CSS resource. Um, so the yeah the the is function is uh, <coughs> is it cannot be used outside of uh, uh, a conditional uh, CSS. So so in uh, in in, close, in Google Closure Style Sheet, you can uh, use a um, uh, function everywhere. Like uh, this one, you can define a constant my padding by using a function hat that will add a 15 pixel with 10 to 20 pixel. Uh, but you cannot do that with the is function. That will that won't work. And I think that doesn't make sense to do that because uh, it's, that's that's. Uh, that doesn't make sense to 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 define uh, a constant uh, that will take the result of the is function because we cannot use uh, this function uh, in the conditional node. So it doesn't make sense, and I think that if we we mention that in uh, in the documentation, it's not really a, a, a big problem. Uh, 
Um, another thing I want to talk also, uh, I want to that you give me your opinion on that, uh, is that uh, <coughs> with the existing CSS resource, we can use uh, a runtime evaluation in a static context. So you can use, you can write conditional CSS uh, and call uh, a static uh, function that will return a boolean uh, at runtime. Uh, it's not supported by uh, GSS resource, and I think uh, I will never support that, uh, just because uh, it's a little bit confusing. Because <coughs> in GSS resource, we can use the conditional CSS to define your constant, and so um, we cannot uh, use a, a if with a, a runtime evaluation for something that we have to to evaluate at compile time. So it's just simply we cannot do that, and uh, and so it's too confusing. We can maybe uh, um, support the runtime evaluation uh, for uh, everything else that it's not defining constant, so just defining uh, uh, some CSS rule and so on. But that needs also a lot of change in Closure Style Sheet to support that. So I prefer to not support that for the first uh, for the I mean. For the yeah. first version. Just so. to be clear, you only the missing part is having a define in if statement, right? Yeah. Okay. That, so this is this is how it's uh, implemented, and I pushed the code uh, today and uh, deployed uh, a new snapshot where people can use that uh, uh, can use that in, in if you want to test. <clears throat> and uh, also, the, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a converter that will be able to convert the, the CSS file uh, compatible with CSS resource to be compatible with GSS resource. And uh, the, the, the converter will be able to translate what are uh, on the right to what are on the left. So it will be able to put that uh, if defining a CSS resource, the conditional, uh, the CSS conditional. Uh, define CSS resource and rewrite that to be uh, compliant with the uh, GSS resource. So Did this end up requiring changes to the uh, GSS grammar? No, I don't do that. Okay. No, because finally, uh, as you know, I'm using a function. I don't need to, to, to change the, 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 the GSS grammar. And I think it's better, I think, if we if we are uh, not obliged to change something in closure style sheet, I think it's better. It's my my opinion. I don't know what you think, but if you can do the, the, the if you can implement everything we need without uh, touching in the code of uh, closure style sheet, I think it, it's better like this. Yeah. So, I, so I guess my question is: Is there anything about this that makes it particularly awkward for the incremental compile stuff? Like I know there's an issue, but with the old CSS. Yeah. So well, there's. So the old CSS resource uh, handling allowed you to reference arbitrary properties on the fly. Um, and what that causes is it makes it so that when you're handling the generator for a CSS resource, um, you have to rerun the generator every time <coughs> the property value changes at any stage of compilation. Um, you might want to close that screen or stop sharing or something. Yeah, that's cool. um, and uh, so it hurts compile times. Using CSS <laughs> right now with incremental compilation, um, if you're changing the values of properties at various stages in your compile tree, then it's going to cause a lot of reruns. Um, and so if we want to make that faster, we just need to make CSS resource less dynamic. It shouldn't have access to arbitrary properties at any time. Yeah, actually, that's, uh, we talked about it before. If you remember, we can not make it, uh, uh, for example, in this case, we can not change it to a static evaluation on the generated code and on the runtime case we can optimize it or not depending on the compilation. So we can still have access to the properties but it can be uh, optimized based on uh, on the last step, right? So that's a potential uh, way of handling it, yeah. Um, so the simplest solutions did not allow it, which I think is reasonable, but there are workarounds. Um, so uh, that being said, GSS resource looks like it has the same functionality. Looks like it can <laughs> act a string as a parameter to uh, to look up properties, which means it can access any property at any time. Which means its output 
uh, might need to be reevaluated at any time because any property could change at any time. Uh, so if you continue to support that, which I'm not uh, familiar with the, the Google style sheet spec, maybe it's a requirement or something. But, um, uh, for existing properties? Well, the, um, the spec that he's implementing against. Well, the is, the is yes. His function is new, right? That's not GSS. That's that's something. Yeah, yeah. that's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. So, like, it. I would prefer that that functionality not be provided <laughs> because it makes it. It basically sets you up for inefficient compiles. Um, alternatively, Gaktu has thought of a way of handling that efficiently, but it will require pretty significant changes to the way you implement your generator. Um, so. so yeah. So, so one one question is with uh, um, you were, before you were saying it can access any property, and then can we figure out just like by parsing the CSS file which property yeah. it actually does so, access? So right now the way I've set it up is that each generator has um, some metadata it can return about itself, and basically it can say I am known to access properties A, B, and C, and then the compiler can watch just those properties and know to rerun the generator just when those properties change. Now, for the, for, uh, if the generator doesn't say what properties it cares about, then the compiler assumes that it cares about all properties. Now, instead, we could make it so that we actually watch what properties are accessed and write them down, and on subsequent stages, if we see values for any of those properties change, then we could know to rerun that particular generator. Um, that's not what I have implemented right now. That could be done. Even that, um, that'll get you back to a, a lot of the time. But not all the time. Somebody's got some feedback. Julian, I think you. So basically, what can happen is uh, even if you do that, if you're writing style sheets to access properties, and then in your build tree you're changing those properties, you're still triggering a lot of recompiles. So uh, yeah, well, there's like, there's a lot of solutions to the problem. I would prefer the one that. Is seems the ones that seem most sane to me, which is to not allow arbitrary property access. But there are a lot of ways to handle it. Mm -hmm. I think first thing we need to check uh, what current CSS code, CSS resources in Google Tree is. Yeah, what expectations are. So we can look at the use cases, and if they are covered, we can simply say no. Yeah. It's, so it's, so I mean, we could we could look at it individual properties. Like I I think. Locale is the sort of thing that you know. Yeah, potentially we whitelist. Well, not whitelist, but we just say that that re that um, generator is known to access user agent and locale. Right. And if anything beyond that is attempted, then we can throw an error. Or, no, I don't know. No, another thing I was wondering about with user agent. So, obviously, that's a good thing for backward compatibility, since that's how we used to do it. Um, I think we had talked before about. Maybe it's not such a good thing to be testing in CSS for specific browsers and or actually specific permutations. It's not really specific browsers. Yeah, and if you switch over to a feature detection type. Thing, yeah, some kind of capabilities thing. Mm -hmm. so I think with CSS, there's less of a capabilities. I think CSS is more focused on the browser, but right. In particular, I, I would be interested. I mean, the easiest way is just do it the same way. And the question yeah. is, is there's some better way to handle this. Um, so, I just thought I'd bring that up. So a little bit of perspective. Um, so the, the implementation we have right now for rerunning generators as efficiently as we can during inter incremental compiles, um, as, much, <coughs> as much work as it can, well, almost as much work as it can. But the truth is that the generator design we have right now just can't possibly ever actually be efficient. Because uh, if a generator is registered anywhere in the tree, it's promised a visibility to all properties and all property values for the entire tree, and it's prom promised visibility to all types defined anywhere in the tree, regardless of when that type was defined in relation to when the generator was registered. Um, so that, plus the fact that it's legal to change the list of allowed values and legal to restrict the list of allowed values for a pro property at any time. So if, you, if you have this dependency tree of XML modules, anywhere up the tree you can redefine, adapt, and change any property that's been previously defined. So that interacting with the fact that the generators need global view of all this information, it puts you in a situation where for a lot a lot of the time you can only know the final values at the very last stage, which means you can't distribute the work and you can't do the work earlier. So um, I think at some point 
if we want to transition from incremental compilation is fast to incremental compilation is super fast, we need to define a, a generator's 2.0 spec that basically removes two or three of those features or two or three of those restrictions and sets it up to where if you register a generator here in the tree, you're saying this generator I've registered has visibility to the properties and types that are available at that moment in time, and there's no transitive sort of growth of that promise. Um, and I think that's the only way it's ever going to be lightning fast. Uh, so that's something to be aware of, and I think the transition of that won't be necessarily evolutionary. I think like we're going to try to make generators as they are now with the promises they're given now as efficient as possible, and then at some point we're going to say generators 2.0, the promises and restrictions are different, they're super fast, and we're probably going to manually port the important generators over. Um, so that's something to be aware of. So how does it relate to GSS? So with GSS, I think GSS probably goes in right now as a yeah. current style generator, and at some point when we do generators 2.0, we port a generators 2.0 version of it that plays within the bounds of generators 2.0. Okay. I think. Okay. But so, there's also uh, another problem with the CSS resources is, is the cleanup after uh, after like code printing we need to do CSS printing which turn I thought we were doing before but it turned out we are not doing this so that's okay. something we need to think about generators because that's that need to put so what about the, the feedback for Julian? The, what is done? Does that seem? The, what, what are the changes we need, or what do we? I think it looks good right now. I mean, uh, I, one of there are two things we need to check: which properties are accessed in Google Tree, and see how okay. they are accessed, uh, why, why they are accessed. And the other thing is, uh, we need to find a pilot project. Or to use this to start playing with this. So, um, so he's got a converter, right? He said, to, mm -hmm. "Okay." So, is the converter also going to sit in the tree, or we would just put it? Uh, so, where are we placing all of this? Just go to, 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 So, it's currently, it's on GitHub. We can keep it on GitHub right now. Okay. Uh, but the long-term plan was try to replace. Yes. So. CSS yeah, with GSS, yeah, right? Yeah. So. And so, how do we? How are we going to affect that? Is that going to happen? Uh, so after. I think finalizing what we have, and uh, so the, the advantage of it, having it a separate library is we can have different releases and we can just break stuff. It's not easier, even we call it experimental inside create. It's not always easier to do the same. Okay, so, I think we should be uh, okay. So maybe it's not for this meeting, but we should talk about how we want to okay. roll this in into Git if you're going to do it, right? Because that's ultimately having it separate. It's there. It's usable. But then we want to encourage people to use it. Yeah. So it's if it's at a separate place. Then yeah, it's, 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 yeah. As soon as we so we don't want probably don't want it to be used by everybody in the start. At least not initially. Yeah. 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 But, really but it has significant it advantages, which is the reason we're excited about it, right? Like the fact that it can parse CSS 3.0 type syntax yeah. and all that. So there's yeah, not so really we want the CSS 3 support, right? I think that's the main yeah. main yeah. Uh, sort of the, that's the so big motivation. Initial motivation yeah. And so if people start using CSS3 and pick this up from GitHub, then it makes it a little bit more cumbersome. Mm -hmm. right? so we, as, we, so it, as soon as we bring it into the Google, it, it's okay. going to be very easy okay. for people to pick up. And also for external people will try it and uh, give feedback on, on stuff. So I think it's good to have that time for making it more mature. Okay. We can take advantage of that. OK. But I, I don't expect a long transition time. Actually, it looks pretty good. It, I'll okay. say uh, as long as we have the converter, that should be. OK. Thanks, Thank Julia. OK. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, one thought I had about the properties. Would it be feasible to um, first parse all of the equipped modules and find all the properties that have been changed before anything else is done? <laughs> so that way you get a kind of flat view to start with? Um, it's potentially possible. You'd have to switch your build system to work in sort of two passes. So uh, the first pass would be all non-generator work in a tree structure and in the process accumulate all properties uh, and, and summarize it. <coughs> and then you would sort of like do the entire tree again, running, uh, except instead of compiling, you'd be doing just generator work at each stage in the tree using a final idea of what the property values are. Um, it could be done. It's a little bit complicated, and it, it also um, 
you now are separating the source code that you're compiling at this stage in the tree from the generator output at that stage in the tree. And sometimes the source code you're you're compiling at that stage in the tree depends has references to the generator output, like with UI binder and that type of thing. I think so. I think it might not work, or you'd have to switch the order. You'd have to like do all the generator work first, and then all the compiled work so that the references can can work. Also, it makes I'm not sure like the cacheability much more complex, right? Because yeah. you have like a hundred different references that provide different properties. Yeah. Sets, so you need to have I different think output for each one of them. It, it's promising in that it might make things, it might allow you to not have to rerun generators. But it is significantly more complicated. We'll have to look at it. But I, I, I think the stuff we discussed earlier, having runtime checks and making them optimized is the way to go. Because it's yeah. code is, makes generators run, run locally. So uh, the, the idea is, Instead of looking at the generator, looking at the property value inside the generator, we can uh, generate a code that looks at the property values on the runtime. And uh, based on static analysis, as the, these values are finalized on the, the final run of the final pass of the compiler, we can optimize them away. So yeah. uh, by this way, the generators can still look at the properties, run locally, generate property independent code. Uh, Property and independent output and output still have it and small. Still, still yeah. have something reasonable. I think that's yeah. that will uh, be the way to go in the long run. So okay. great. Okay. Thanks. Um, let's see. <coughs> so James, you want to talk about your Eclipse plugin? <coughs> Uh, sure. So the uh, source map debugging plugin. Um, I'm not sure anyone has any background. So basically, we just took the uh, Dart debugger plugin and ripped out all the Dart dependent stuff and made it um, use abstract breakpoints. And current the current implementation can set a breakpoint in Java, catch it in the debugger, view the variables with their obfuscated names, um, and all of the uh, native JavaScript objects like events and elements in the debugger. Currently, the stepping is just issuing stepper statements back into Chrome, so it's not really um, stepping based on Java, it's stepping based on JavaScript. So um, we're, Ivan and I are discussing how we can um, implement that as our next step, and then um, in an email thread with Ray, we have been discussing how to do field name mapping, and it's considerably more difficult, but um, it is possible. So that's going to be my new pet project for the next uh, two or three weeks, just to try to basically capture the scope of each variable so that we can reference it back to either the instance variable or field variable um, that it comes from. So um, initial implementation works OK <laughs> now. Um, it can pull source code from jars and source class path just off whatever your project has available. So um, most of the heavy lifting was already done by the Dart team. So um, now it's just a matter of refining the stepping process. And um, if we are going to do the field name mapping, it's going to require changing some stuff in the quit generator. So what I'm planning to do there is to just basically run a separate uh, fork off of quit master that has these changes and work with it so that it has a different version of source map spec so we can have the plugin able to just read 3.0 like normal, and then um, while developing, you know, have 3.1 or whatever for the field name deobfuscation until that actually works, and then um, present that to the source map committee to see if it's um, viable to get introduced to the spec. Oh. So this I, is great. I, this is actually yeah. really, really great progress. Like progress. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I like it. So, <laughs> yeah. so we actually have a plugin that's working now, and we can. <laughs> yeah, and it was basically all for free from the Dart team. Like, we really just renamed well, stuff. So there is work to be uh, done, right? It's yeah. not like it's all free. You have to actually no. get that yeah. thing. But thanks. That, that's actually that's awesome. We should. Um, are you planning to just get get it open? So I don't know where it's at in terms of the Oh, um, I'll awesome. make a post on PG+. It is on GitHub right now, and uh, okay. we do have two other developers interested, and anyone else who does want to jump in, um, more than invited, because uh, the more the merrier, right? So... So yeah, this is just great. We should, yeah. uh, we should. How do we um, publicize? Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know if it's already usable or there's more things that need to be done I, before I, it's I, usable. I, Sounds I like have it's a little bit beta. Yeah, uh, I think maybe. So right now it's it's basically whatever is in the GitHub repository, right? I mean, we haven't. Yes. It might make sense when you think that it's 
is a good place to move forward is can we cut some kind of binary release even you know with all these super global cat apps that's just the first right. Um, yeah, it does build a P2 repo that we can just deploy anywhere and give people a link. Uh, we're just using Tyco to build it. So um, with the build, you can either deploy a repository or um, have the build actually install a copy of Eclipse for you. And so uh, one of my goals is that the <laughs> is going to set up the Git plugin and a test project and everything. So if someone wants to pull it down from Git, they can just run a Maven command and get the Eclipse installed with everything set up and just pop it open and run it. So um, mm -hmm. that's kind of a lower priority until we get the stepping fixed. Um, okay. The stepping isn't great, because right now, like I said, it's using just yeah. JavaScript. So if you have one great big line um, where it steps in Java isn't always intuitive. Yeah. But um, the actual place where that's happening, Ivan has, he says he knows what he needs to do. He just needs some time to do it. So um, I'll, I'll see what he thinks about cutting a release anytime soon so that we can actually say, hey, just add this to your clips and, you know, 0 0.5 mm -hmm. or whatever. I, yeah, yeah. And it just, I mean, it can be, I mean, you don't even have to say a release. <laughs> just, like, say it's a test version. It, you know, it's for queuing it. Queuing it. Right. Is there, like, a standard way where, where Eclipse plugins can be found? Or yeah, there's a marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Is that a, so there's a marketplace? Yeah. So we should okay. probably put that in a mm -hmm. where, where, where it's people, a standard yeah. place where people can get uh, as a plugin to their yeah. Eclipse, but it has to. This only works for a certain version of Eclipse, or this is just. Uh, it works with any version in particular. I mean, we do have some dependencies on specific uh, JDT modules, but okay. um, okay. Like, oh, actually, uh, Eclipse Core. So um, I'll talk with Ivan to see if we can, like, it uses version ranges. So we'll see if we can make sure that's like, the lowest possible version range. Yeah. But it does work with Juno and Kepler. So um, if anyone is older than that, I mean, yeah. get them to submit a bug report. Yeah. Yeah, I think you may, we may even find users internally for this, right? So yeah, that's, can actually that's get what I'm thinking. Yeah. Right. So well, we if get, we get it really, then we can just try it. We, you'll get yeah. users inside who, who yeah. will use it. Uh, wow. Juno, is that 3.8? Um, I think that's 4.2. I'm not okay. entirely sure. I'll try to cover at least 3.8, because so, I use 3.8. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I, the other thing is also the, there's a bunch of... I think we talked about this is... Even though we have the source maps, it's not perfect. We, we can do a number of things on the compiler side to make mm -hmm. code generation yeah. and other things more, so more conducive so that point, to debugging. I, th I think like right. what uh, he was saying that Ivan has an idea for how to make the, the JavaScript stepping match up with the line number stepping in Java. And probably that would be changing the compiler output so that all the JavaScript that corresponds with a particular line in Java would be on one line in the output. That would, yeah. Something so, like that, probably. Yeah. Yeah. must enforce. Okay. For something else. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the well, exception stick traces is. Okay, this is great. I think we should keep keep. Uh, so there's an ongoing discussion between between people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay. I'm not sure where we are as far as setting up a mailing list so that it's a little bit more in the open. But, um, uh, there is a Google group set up too. It's linked to in the GitHub documentation. So there's no participation yet, but it's there. So it'll be the place okay. to file okay. bugs. Okay. I'll, I'll okay. make sure to subscribe to that. So there you go. Cool. Okay. All right. So I, I wonder what the Dart is doing for the variable names and field names and. Um, well, they're, they're more straightforward. They're using. Right? The, they have their own VM, so the connection to their own variables is easier. Uh, for the source. Yeah, source? they they have they have access to everything, so that as soon as you go into um, a line of JavaScript, it actually basically points directly to the the Dart source, and they're using Dartium as the browser. So even um, their like their their mapping is just it's direct one-to-one, -one. so it seems like when they generate their JavaScript, it steps naturally based on Dart structure. So um, one thing I was actually thinking about is if the incremental compiler, if it's basically leaving, um, like it's not optimizing as heavily, it's not inlining as much, that might make it more conducive to um, you know easier okay. stepping. So um, if possible to play with that, um, it might be interesting to try that because, like I said, with the field mapping, I'm going to have to do some changes to the compiler anyway. So yeah. If I'm going to so, cut against any branch, I might as well try to cut against that one. Yeah, so uh, the output of the the incremental compilation, the only difference is it's basically draft mode in that there's there's no inlining, there's no uh, pruning and all that. But um, other than that, it's using the detailed namer, so that names are really long but are accurate across module. Um, and the only other difference is that uh, you know how at the very bottom of the JavaScript output for, for our GWT compile, there's this little bootstrap section? Now there's one bootstrap per module, and they're sort of like executed in order. Um, so those are the differences. I, I don't, I think like 
if you just uh, trigger optimize zero compile, you're going to and detailed name, you're going to get pretty much the same sort of structure. So we have only okay. uh, five minutes left. So I want to uh, just quickly. Uh, this is great. So you said there's a GitHub group. What's the name of the group or something you can? Uh, it's GitHub slash sdbg slash sdbg. So um, the goal, like I said, also is that we're going to start focusing on GWT, but eventually um, support all source mapped uh, yeah. compiled languages. Okay. So. Might as well, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is great. Yeah. This is just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks to Brian for pointing us, hooking me and Ivan up too, because uh, I was just going to basically start writing from scratch and <coughs> fell into the Dart plugin and it saved us like months. So Yeah, they've already done that work, right? We've been talking, like, so it's, yeah, just leverage. Uh, great. Uh, let's see, we have a few more minutes. So anybody else? Colin or uh, anything from Sencha you want to talk about, add? Or anybody else wants to bring up anything? Uh, the only thing I was going to mention is uh, I was playing with some linker stuff from a discussion on Stack Overflow in the Google Plus group about uh, web workers. And digging into that further, it looks like there's a lot of deprecated stuff in there. I don't know what other changes are happening into workers anyway, but it uh, looked like some low-hanging fruit to delete really, really old dead code. So uh, that's the only thing of interest there. If anyone knows of any other work happening in linkers, maybe I'll leave it alone for the time being. But uh, if not, I'm I'm looking to submit a patch soon that just deletes a whole bunch of deadlines. Yeah, oh, that'd in, be great. In which if, files? If I, I'd say if Ray is okay with it, we're probably okay because Ray knows the most about web workers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll just put up. Oh, and then this would be just for the existing linkers rather than digging into the web worker side too much. Um, yeah. the web worker discussion uh, is sort of going in a couple of different directions of, of where we should be, but the linker side was just looking at the uh, various. Um, selection script linkers, and the fact that there's some methods that have to be overridden, and it turns out some of them don't need to be overridden anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Just trying to clean it up that way it's at least readable to start thinking about the web worker problem for someone who's not yet familiar with web, with uh, linkers. Yeah, so the web worker linkers will still be there, but some dead code will be removed from them, basically. But it's really the, the main selection linkers themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And then yeah. as we got to this direction, we found there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff in the dev mode wiring that still worked for the old style of dev mode which was in process. Wow. So we still every time check to see if the no script, inside no script JS, or sorry, no uh, cache JS, if that plugin is uh, wired up, and if it is, we refresh the page. Okay. Uh, that can probably go by now. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I think the, um, the general direction we're going like with the internal linkers at Google is to make everything a subclass like the cross-site iframe linker. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think that might include like web worker linkers that Ray is working on. So j just so you know, that, that's kind of the I'm, this is kind of the direction that I, I think we're going with with web worker stuff. I may have misunderstood you, but you're saying the iframe linker for web workers. There's a there's a cross-site iframe linker, which is but you no. can't use iframe sure. web workers. Yeah, I think the yeah, best thing yeah. is to get get Not Ray in more and talk to him because I don't know. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll let Ray tear. tear. Yeah, okay. just, I'll try to just just connect the bottom line. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would have been on this call. Just today okay. he was just busy. But uh, let's see. Um, last few minutes. Anything else that people want to bring up? Any other patches people want to discuss? There's any. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. It's, um, um, Thanks for all the hard work here. I know this is all like voluntary uh, <laughs> stuff, especially from outside. So I think this is great. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye. 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 Okay. Thanks. Neat stuff.